Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Bites of Good Live. We are so excited to have you today. Bites of Good Live is a monthly speaker series hosted by Hack for Impact with the goal of engaging both Hack for Impact members and our greater community in critical discussions about technology, the role it plays in our society, and career paths in the social good space. But before we start today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the chaos surrounding the US election results and the violent protests that are happening in DC. I know today and this election season in general has been stressful for many, so I hope you are all taking time for yourselves and that you and your loved ones are staying safe. For our event today, we are joined by the Executive Director of Coding It Forward and two members of Hack for Impact who also completed Coding It Forward Civic Digital Fellowship. They are going to be telling us all about the fellowship and their experiences working with the federal government. We will start with a short overview of the fellowship, then go into a moderated Q&A before taking questions from all of you. So please feel free to send any questions in the chat throughout the event. Thank you again, Rachel, Tiffany, and Regine for being here with us. And with that, let's get started. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us here today. I'm Rachel, I'm one of the co-founders of Coding It Forward and currently serve as our executive director. And as was mentioned, I'm just gonna run through a quick presentation about our fellowship program and give you an overview of some of the benefits of our program as well as our application process. So I'm going to quickly share my screen if you give me one moment. Perfect, hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the fellowship program. It's a paid 10 week internship experience for mission driven software engineers, data scientists, designers and product managers to modernize technology at federal government agencies. The program does run over the course of the summer from the first week of June to about mid August. I recognize that this might interfere with some quarter system schools and their schedules, However, rest assured that we have worked with plenty of quarter system students in the past to accommodate them and make sure that they are able to complete their finals and their exams uh, before the start of the program or during the first week. I also wanted to point out some of the amazing federal agencies that we work with, including the Census Bureau, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Internal Revenue Service, as well as the State Department. These are some of our partners from both the past and the present um, who have helped bring on fellows and mentor them in the civic technology space. In terms of the requirements of our program, which I'm guessing you're probably curious about considering you're attending today's event, there are three main requirements in order to apply to be a fellow. The first is U.S. citizenship due to federal hiring regulations. Unfortunately, this means that permanent residents and DACA recipients are ineligible to apply, but I will share a link in the chat to our newsletter in case you're interested in other social impact opportunities, but perhaps are not a US citizen. Second, you must be currently enrolled in or recently graduated from an undergraduate or graduate program at an accredited institution of higher learning. What this means is that you must be pursuing a two or four year degree in order to participate in the program. And if you took time off during the 2020-21 school year due to COVID-19 or other personal matters, you must be re-enrolling in your studies in the fall of 2021. And finally, in terms of your graduation date, all fellows should be graduating no earlier than this past December, so December 2020. First years who have yet to complete coursework are also ineligible to apply. In terms of how the program will function, I'm sure you might be wondering about our virtual versus our in-person setup for this coming year. Obviously, the COVID uh, virus has not gone anywhere and the pandemic is still raging within the United States. So our team wants to ensure you all that ensure that the health and safety of our community comes first. So what this might look like is in the case that a COVID-19 vaccine is not widely distributed by this upcoming June, the program will most likely be virtual. If that is the case, all students will receive at least a $6,000 stipend and you'll be able to work from anywhere within the United States. And the case that, fingers crossed, a vaccine is distributed and we are able to return to a somewhat normal uh, workplace, uh, the program will be offered in person. 
and all students will be offered at least a $4,000 stipend. Housing, which is usually in the form of apartment accommodations, as well as travel to and from Washington, D.C., from anywhere within the United States. Either way, whether this program occurs virtually or in person, our team is fully prepared to offer multiple benefits to all of you, including pairing you one-on-one -on -one with a mentor from the civic technology space, offering intimate events with leading technology organizations as well as civic institutions, as well as a strong and supportive community of peers who are also interested in social impact technology. You might be wondering who some of these fellows are that I'm talking about. You'll get to meet two of our alumni later at this event, but overall we have had over 200 fellows complete the program at 11 different federal agencies. They represent over 25 states across this country, 78 academic institutions, and come from a diversity of backgrounds. 73% of our fellows have identified as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and 7% identify as Hispanic or Latinx, and 51% identify as women. We're really proud of these numbers considering what the overall statistics look like in the technology space, considering that our cohorts have all been a majority women and a majority people of color, but we also understand and recognize that we have continuous work to do. Finally, uh, some areas of practice that our students work in and that our alumni will talk a little bit about later in this panel discussion. We have four main areas of practice that uh, fellows can choose from in our application process. These include software engineering, data science, product management, and design. As you'll see on the screen, um, these cover a range of areas because all of our agencies kind of have different projects, different missions and goals that they're looking to accomplish. So if you're applying for a software engineering internship, for example, um, you might be working on anything from web development to cloud computing to cybersecurity. Some of the fun things that happen outside of the program include our programming perks. So when you're not working, we offer a range of benefits to all of our fellows. These include professional programming events, on this slide, this is a screenshot from an event this past summer with the US Digital Service. But no matter whether we're in person or virtual, we make sure to offer tons of events where you can learn from other civic technologists, including folks from Code for America, the US Digital Service, as I mentioned, Upsolve, which is a uh, nonprofit organization, as well as NAVA, which is a digital consultancy for the federal government. We also pair everyone one-on-one -on -one with a mentor, as I previously mentioned, to make sure that you feel supported at the start of your career journey. We also offer lots of fun social events so that you get to know your fellow fellows, whether we're together in person or gathering via Zoom. Activities in the past have included book clubs, trivia nights, we've done paint nights, and more. Plus, we also arrange small group matches so that you can get to know your fellow fellows and uh, make sure you're mixing and mingling amongst the cohort. You might also be wondering what happens after the fellowship. Uh, this sounds like a really cool opportunity, but maybe you've struggled to find internship opportunities at the intersections of technology and social impact in the past. Well, I'm excited to share that um, first of all, the Civic Digital Fellowship has had a really astounding effect on our alumni, with 90% of them being more likely to pursue social impact technology in their career. And as one of our alumni uh, kind of stated this past year, the experiences that you'll have as a Civic Digital Fellow will change the way that you think about the jobs you apply for for years down the road. Being a fellow was really awesome and opening my eyes to all these opportunities they didn't know existed before. So where are our alumni? They're working across a range of sectors from the government to the social impact space to graduate school to the private sector. I know that Tiffany and Regine will probably touch on this a little bit later in the panel, so I don't want to spend too much time here, but this slide does really illustrate the variety of fields that being a fellow empowers you to pursue. And most importantly, our application process, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what it means to apply to our program and how our overall process works, since it might be different than internships you've experienced before. So don't be afraid of this chart. I know it looks a little convoluted, but I promise our 
process is pretty straightforward. Um, so first of all, you need to apply for the program. Applications are due later this month, January 24th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. Um, however, we definitely encourage folks to apply early because applications are being reviewed on a rolling basis. We are currently conducting our initial review. Every application is read by three reviewers to make sure that you receive a fair and equitable review. If our team believes that you might be a fit for the program, we'll extend you an offer to interview with a member of our team. These interviews are already taking place, so again, make sure you apply early. If we think you're a good fit based on the video interview and our conversation with you, we'll go ahead and refer you to a federal agency uh, towards the end of January or early February. These agency interviews will involve talking with members of a team that you might be paired with, um, and if they think it's a good fit, then great, you'll be extended an offer and you'll get to accept or deny the position based on your preferences. In the case that the agency decides to pursue another candidate, that's okay. We'll actually move you back into the candidate pool to make sure that um, we can find a different match for you. In the case that we're not able to do so, that will ultimately lead to a rejection from our program, but we do try our best uh, to find a good fit for you whenever we can. And in terms of what we look for in applications, this includes a variety of things. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is technical ability, but we really ask that you show and demonstrate your skills instead of just telling us about them. So whenever possible, we encourage our applicants to include links to things like your portfolio, GitHub, class projects. Um, some folks have even included Dropbox links or Google Drive links. Most importantly, we ask that you just include all your relevant frameworks and skill sets and any programming languages that you might know or that might be relevant in your resume. That way, when we are going through the matching process, it makes it really easy for our team to identify uh, potential fits for you. Second, there are several short answer questions in our application. Nothing super scary or, or challenging to answer, but um, we do wanna learn a little bit more about you beyond your resume and your portfolio. We ask that you try and use recent personal examples to illustrate your answers and check for spelling and grammar mistakes uh, just to make sure that your answers are easy to read. And most importantly, don't try and fit any sort of mold by answering these questions. We want you to be yourself and show your authentic self. And finally, people skills. This is a really important part of the fellowship, as I'm sure you'll hear again in our panel. But we want to make sure that you're comfortable navigating ambiguous situations and that you like working with other people, including those who might not share your opinion or your skill set. This is really important because fellows work with all sorts of stakeholders throughout the 10 weeks in the fellowship, and we want to make sure that you're comfortable navigating situations that don't just involve uh, technical expertise, but also involve um, working with others. And things that are less important to us include your GPA, that does not play a really big factor in our process at all, where you go to school, again, not super important to us or what you did in high school. We want you to focus on your present and most recent accomplishments. Finally, this is a list of resources which will be shared with you after this presentation. I'll make sure these slides get to the Hack for Impact team. Uh, but these are some resources you can look into further if you're interested in learning more about the fellowship after this panel. And I believe that is my last slide. All right, thank you so much, Rachel, for that great introduction. Um, we also have two other panelists here today. Um, I wanna take a second to um, have them introduce themselves. So um, how about maybe we can start with Tiffany and um, maybe you guys can just introduce yourselves and maybe explain um, the types of projects you worked on during your time as um, a fellow for the Civic um, Fellowship. Hi, my name is Tiffany Duong, and I'm a junior at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign within Hack for Impact. I'm the co-director of the UIUC chapter, and this past fall, I was a Civic Digital Fellow uh, working within product manage management with the National Institutes of Health. Hi, my name is Regine DeGuzman. I was a 2018 Civic Digital Fellow. Um, I also 
uh, worked with the U.S. Census Bureau, um, working in statistics in schools, and um, yeah. So right, currently, I'm actually a product manager at um, Visa. So there was some trajectory during my um, time as a fellow, but I, I did graduate from UC Irvine. Um, and then, uh, so for the projects that you guys worked on um, through the fellowship, can you maybe go a little bit more in um, depth to the types of work that you did as a fellow? Yeah, totally. So mm -hmm. I worked for the National Institutes of Health as part of the Strides Initiative to bring cloud-based services such as AWS, GCP, to biomedical research. So specifically for bioinformaticians, for example, or IT professionals working for the NIH. And in general, one thing to acknowledge is the NIH is just huge. There are 40,000 people working in a variety of different institutes and centers and capacities. So trying to design different offerings for them, especially as it related to these cloud-based services, proved challenging. And the main project that I worked on was to was to design an offering of GitHub Enterprise Cloud for the various different ICs because they're all doing it in a very siloed approach or had a variety of different Git management or version control tracking systems or even none at all. So bringing them up to speed and having this sort of centralized offering to better facilitate the transition to cloud was one of the projects I worked on. And the second one was working with the learning and development side of my team in bringing different users and different scientists, bioinformaticians up to the latest technologies as it regards to AWS and data science and GCP. So trying to design those offerings so as to meet them where they were and to make it so it was easy for them to use in a variety of methods and beyond just traditional classroom training, but thinking beyond to office hours or having some sort of better facilitation of community-based learning. So having those two experiences in mind, I was able to apply my experience with human-centered design and product management to those different projects and work with a variety of different people within my team who are, had backgrounds ranging from engineering to uh, traditional bioinformatics to more managerial positions. So it was a really pleasant experience. So for me in 2018, I got to work with the U.S. Census Bureau in Suitland, Maryland, um, and this was in person. So it was a really amazing experience being in Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Uh, I specifically worked on data science initiatives for um, the U.S. Census Bureau on the statistics in, uh, in schools team. A team. So within this team, uh, any material that goes to K kindergarten to 12th grade, um, I specifically worked on with that team. Um, and you can actually look at on web online um, statistics in schools at the U.S. Census Bureau. So they have a lots of materials. Um, but one thing that the U.S. Census recognized is that data science literacy, computer science literacy is super important. Um, so I got to be as a product manage, manager uh, fellow to help create those initiatives, um, kind of figure out what would be best, kind of like almost a consulting opportunity. Um, because my prior experience with um, Hack for Impact and also interning at Khan Academy, I did some similar projects with K through nine, um, or sorry, K through 12 um, material. So that was really amazing experience because up until then, um, that was my passion was how do we integrate technology and to um, technology and um, like social good together. Um, a lot of the things that I learned from that that I actually found very beneficial was um, having opportunity to learn about product management because you can't really learn that in school. I initially was um, learning computer engineering um, and I didn't get that opportunity other than like personal projects to really understand how does software flow, how does 
development work. Um, so that was a really amazing opportunity because um, no, now I am a product manager. So I think that really influenced my career decision um, at a, you know, at a huge institution. So I think that was really important to me. Um, so yeah, um, basically with my project, um, it became something that other fellows and the rest of the team, our team was very small, uh, continued after um, my fellowship, but I was really um, grateful that we got that ball rolling um, because without, um, because on my specific team, there wasn't actually any statisticians or um, uh, educators. So I came from that background. Um, so that was really awesome to actually get that started. And I'm really happy with the production, production it's going. It's amazing, thank you. So um, outside of the uh, fellows that we have here today, there are some other fellowships that are offered um, through Coding It Forward. Um, or through the Civic Digital um, Fellowship, specifically um, uh, the Design Fellowship. So um, maybe, Rachel, could you explain perhaps some uh, projects that maybe a Design Fellow would go through? For sure. So as I mentioned uh, in my brief presentation, there's a variety of different roles that all of our fellows uh, work in. For Design Fellows, that can look for, uh, to range from graphic design to branding, uh, UX research, product design, it really varies based on what an agency is looking for. Uh, two concrete examples I can give are one from this is one from this past summer. So um, Amy Lowe, who is one of our fellows working at the US Census Bureau, worked on a redesign for Census Academy with an improved UI and UX presence and also worked on developing an interactive learning feature, which was targeted towards small business owners. So hers was more focused on UX UI and product design. We also had a fellow last summer, so or two summers ago now in 2019, uh, Jerry, who worked as a design fellow at the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And she worked on conducting user research and creating prototypes and running usability tests to design a minimal viable product, minimum viable product for a centralized refugee case management system. So um, again, really widely kind of ranges in terms of what the agency is looking for, but I think those are two awesome examples of how you can um, really use your design skills in an impactful manner and um, really get some great portfolio experience as well. Oh, thank you so much. It's amazing to hear the kind of mission-driven um, projects that come out of the civic digital leadership um, to hear from our fellows as well as from Rachel. So um, coming from uh, the Hack for Impact community, um, our main goal as an organization is really to build nonprofit software for social good. And um, for our audience here today, um, what kind of ways do you think that our mission here at Hack for Impact kind of um, falls in line with the mission of the Civic Digital Fellowship. Yeah, so I'd say that Civic Tech in general is all about building technology for the public with their interests in mind. And even beyond that, I'd say it's not just designing or creating for the public, but designing with the public or with uh, the people who are representing them. So that's the, the main goal throughout Civic Technology. And you can find that within the Civic Digital Fellowship and beyond. And then what I love about the Civic Digital Fellowship, though, is it really gives the opportunity for a lot of like-minded young technologists interested in social impact technology, like within Hack for Impact, to really hone their skills and apply them to real-world situations, and applying them to helping out nonprofits or a governmental agency. And this is the sort of connections and discourse that goes beyond the fellowship itself. So it isn't just something that begins and ends within college in your time in Hack for Impact officially or even within your fellowship itself. These are connections that I think would last for a lifetime. And 
that sort of community is something that really appeals to me. And I think that appeals to a lot of people too. And I can see this within my fellowship cohort itself even. It's only been a few weeks now that since we've ended, but we all try to talk to each other almost every day or try to hop on board game nights every week. So trying to keep that discourse going and then the learnings that we have from these experiences do affect our viewpoints on, the, on life and our career in general. And I think that's something that is found throughout a lot of these different efforts within Hack for Impact or Civic Digital Fellowship. It's really cool to see. Yes. Um, so just like Tiffany, like it's sort of how are we going to help the community? Um, when I was in college, like I was wanting to do something more out of college and like how do I apply all the things I've learned to something that's innovative, something that's um, I can drive, I use my passion for helping out people. Um, when I was in high school, I loved volunteering. Like I, you know, anything with education and volunteering, I was the first person to sign up for it. So when I got to college, I learned how to code. Um, actually prior to um, college, I actually didn't know how to code. So um, when I learned about computer science in college, it was um, something that was eye-opening because a lot of the solutions that most nonprofit organizations need is technical solutions, but those people do not come from that background or probably don't have the expertise in it. So when I found about Hack for Impact, I thought this is something really amazing. I didn't know something like this existed. I actually was very fortunate enough to um, go to an event at Airbnb headquarters about Hack for Impact a couple of years ago, and I wanted to sign up immediately. Um, so with that in mind, um, tying back, you know, with our project for Hack for Impact, I got to help serve my, my local community. But when I got to the Civic Digital Fellowship, um, it was an amazing opportunity because I had applied what I learned from Hack for Impact to the Civic Digital Fellowship. How do I think of a bigger picture? How do I think about creative solutions that might not be completely technically advanced, maybe not using, you know, the biggest technology technology trends out there like you know, AI or ML or whatnot. Um, so it's like more about serving the community, finding the best solution and seeing where we can help um, people. I do definitely think that both the pro these, um, you know, these two are co like they are pretty synchronous. Um, you get to help out and also apply all the knowledge that you've gained in college, which I think is a rare experience because most people just, you know, head off to an internship or head off to a, um, you know, full-time job, but they don't get to interact with something very um, personal and um, somewhere you can apply your passion. So I definitely feel very fortunate to have experienced both opportunities. Amazing. Thank you. So um, back in 2017 for you, Rachel, um, you were a member of the first ever Civic Digital Fellowship. Um, right? um, before getting more involved in the organization as um, an actual employee. So you've kind of been around since the very beginning. Um, what kind of um, ways have you seen the fellowship grow or develop over the years that you've been involved? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have scaled quite a bit since 2017. It's been really exciting. Um, all the student demand we've received for positions like uh, the Civic Digital Fellowship. When I was a fellow, it was a fairly experimental program. There were only 14 of us from 11 different universities across the country. Um, so it was a really small and intimate group. And there was only one agency partner that we are working with at the time, which was the US Census Bureau. It turned out that um, people were so happy with the results of the program, uh, that word kind of spread to other agencies that both the census worked with as well as elsewhere. And um, people became really interested in hiring technical talent that was capable of accomplishing um, these really impactful goals in a short period of time. So in the past few years, we've scaled Oh my gosh, I think almost four times over. I apologize if my math is wrong. It's It's been quite a day with, with current events, but um, we have now had 
over 60 students this past summer in our cohort, just to give an idea of how much the scale has changed. And I believe they came from something like 40 different colleges and universities. So that gives you an idea of just kind of how the reach itself has grown. As I mentioned in my presentation as well, we've now had over 200 alumni, which I don't think is something uh, we would have ever imagined for ourselves back when the program was starting in 2017. Um, definitely didn't even know if we were gonna stick around for the next year, let alone the next almost four years. Um, but we're now going on our sixth cohort with this upcoming summer. And I'm really excited to see how we can continue to engage students from a range of backgrounds and perspectives. As I mentioned, that's something we're always working on is figuring out how to diversify our community, um, not only from the perspective of things like gender, race, and ethnicity, but also so socioeconomic status, um, as well as first-generation college students and making sure that we're engaging people from all sorts of backgrounds and making sure that our fellowship reflects the diverse citizenry of this country. Well, thank you, that's so special. Um, so for our panelists here who have um, been a part of the fellowship, looking back, what do you think has been the most transformative or, or valuable moment of your time um, in the fellowship? Whether that be through the viewpoint of your career, your skill set, how you view yourself, um, et cetera. So when you hear your experiences. Yeah, I'd say that one of the most transformative experiences or moments that really happened was facing the reality of civic technology, which is that a lot of times things are under-resourced or ambiguous and having to navigate those situations at first was difficult for me because being used to internships with very cookie cutter activities or projects versus going into the civic technology and having a plan of doing X, Y, Z, but then not being able to do it or do it in the way that you had initially planned out or intended. So specifically, I was doing user research interviews for my GitHub enterprise project. And we came across one of our first interviewees and right off the bat, almost right away, he told us that he thought that our project and our ideas were bad and that it wouldn't be successful within the NIH and we faced a lot of pushback there and we left that meeting my co-fellow and I and we were just like oh no what are we supposed to do here <laughs> like we gotta tell our supervisors the entire project's a sham like we gotta throw it all away but then taking a step back and hearing the opinions of people who have push back to what you're doing and realizing that it's hard to do civic technology it's hard to go into this type of work and do what's necessary in order to bring people up to like the latest technologies. And there's always going to be people against things you're doing in those efforts. So I feel like that's such a large lesson that I learned. And it goes beyond just the big technology and any full-time work or in real life, quote unquote. But I think within so technology, it happens a lot, just in trying to design for such a large scale of people and doing it with your best intentions in mind. It can be difficult, but at the same time, so rewarding when finally realizing how the projects you're doing make a difference in a lot of different people's lives. So that's some I kind of want to imbue within the work that I do moving forward in terms of the opportunities I seek out and why I want to be doing them. Yeah, so I personally experienced, you know, I, you know, for uh, Civic Touch, for the Civic Digital Fellowship, sorry, I have a puppy, so he might be making noise. Um, he, um, so with the Civic Digital Fellowship, Entering it in, I was, you know, a first college, first generation college student. And I did not expect that I would be able to have an opportunity like this. Um, so it's really, for me, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think being at, uh, in Washington, D.C. and helping at the U.S. Census Bureau, something that I personally would never have, um, have done or imagine have ever been doing, I think that was really something that was life-changing. I definitely think that there was times where I felt like I had some imposter syndrome and I didn't think I could do it. I thought the project was way too big um, 
you know, why do they trust me with this? But, you know, I did find a lot of confidence during my fellowship that, you know, I can do it. I've gone this far and I can do it. Um, recently, I was um, I was a teaching teaching assistant for a um, one of the CS the CS class at UCI, and a lot of the people or a lot of the students actually had emailed me and saying like you know I don't know if I can do something like this or I can't I don't know if I'm qualified for an internship, but you know sharing my experience with Civic Digital Fellowship how that really opened up you know my horizons really. Um, really inspired these students to go for it because um, during the time at, when I was a civic digital fellow, I didn't think I could do it. And I think, you know, constant pressure from like the technology industry um, and then also being in Washington DC, I just felt, you know, isolated. Out of this experience, I actually ended up interning at so many places. Uh, I was at Disney working on Disney Plus. I ended up working at Tesla. I ended up also doing an internship at um, Visa. Um, and then now I'm actually an associate product, manage, product manager at Visa. Because um, all those experiences, I wanted to find what I was good at. And I think that with a Civic Digital Fellowship, it led me to that direction to find my confidence, especially when, you know, during this climate and during, um, all these factors that may be against you when you complete the civic digital fellowship you have a you know you know you have a sense of pride that builds over time and i think that was something that was super important for me um, moving forward in my career thank you um the next question actually has a lot to do with um, what you mentioned about uh, you not knowing what you wanted to do um, uh, in regards to your career and then having that uh, sort of come um, from your experience um, in the fellowship. So I guess to all of you, if um, you think about your career uh, goals before your time in the fellowship versus afterwards, how do you think um, or how did you see those goals um, maybe change direction or in, in what ways did the fellowship affect um, what your career goals were? I think that the fellowship has really opened up a plethora of different opportunities out there for me that I'd never considered before. So I think like a lot of different people, I've always wanted to be doing something for good, whatever that meant. So within technology and best using my skills, that meant social impact technology more or less, but I didn't necessarily know what that meant. Was that working for a nonprofit? Was that working for a mission-driven company? But now that I've been through the fellowship and had the opportunity to engage with a variety of mentors, speakers, panelists, and other fellows at different universities, and really go through all of these different opportunities, be it within impact investing, tech nonprofits, social enterprises, tech policy, or even within civic technology, there's a wide range there between working as a federal employee to a contractor to a government consultancy agency. Being exposed to all of this really opened up a lot of different opportunities for me. And I think that moving forward now, it just seems like world's my oyster just there are so many different ways to get involved and also different pathways to a lot of different people we talked to didn't end up in civic technology right away or were in the private sector for several different years and moved back and forth even so realizing too that there are a lot of different ways to contribute within this space and to do so with our best abilities in mind. I know Regine talked to this too, where um, using the tech skills that we have, we're learning in school and being able to make the difference where we can the most. So within the different companies we work for even and trying to change the culture, there's so many ways we can contribute. And I think that's something that I will be continuing to look for within my career. Yeah, um, so for me, I definitely feel like I was able to try a lot of different things after like the fellowship. And most of the part, most of the things that I gathered in the fellowship was, you know, your network. Um, 
I mean, that was like one of the more important things that I got from the fellowship. Um, CDF has amazing um, mentor and mentor network. So I actually had a conversation with my mentor before um, before I left the fellowship. And I you know, told him like, I don't know if I really wanna be a software engineer. Like it, you know, um, coming back to Silicon Valley, like I don't know if I like to, you know, be sitting in front of a computer all day being, you know, told to fix this problem, that problem. And he told me that, you know, do what you're passionate about, of course, um, but get that, um, you know, private experience because that private experience will help you go a long way in the government, in government, the government sector. Um, one of my, um, one of my goals now is actually to be part of, um, oh, now I'm forgetting the name, um, uh, Rachel, I think, <laughs> USDS. There you go. <laughs> I like. I thought that was what you were gonna say, but I, I didn't want to say it wrong. <laughs> so actually, a lot of people at USDS, um, they come from private sector. So that was something that I was like, okay, I'm gonna do private sector. Um, that was a personal choice that I wanted to make, um, and then end up um, applying for USDS. Um, so that was something that you know, I kept in mind when I was selecting jobs, selecting internships, let me get, you know, my, my you know, my foot in the door, and then I will take what I know in, um, into the government sector. One of the benefits of the private sector is that it moves fast, unlike the government. Um, so that was something I considered. However, um, I was more passionate about working in government. I want to be able to become a technical change agent. Um, and you can't really do that in uh, the private sector. It's not much you can change. A lot of, like personally, like now that I'm working, um, I don't get to make that impact as much. Um, I love my company, of course, but at my end goal is definitely going back into government. And I think without the Civic Digital Fellowship, I would have never have thought of wanting to do that so badly. Um, it is difficult to get into um, government internships and jobs. Um, there's a lot of red tape or a lot of um, kind of hurdles you have to get through. Um, so it definitely isn't easy, uh, especially being here in Silicon Valley. I'm located in San Francisco right now. Um, there is not a lot of opportunities for civic, um, civic technology jobs. Um, a lot of them are more associated with like city government. Um, so it's really difficult to kind of navigate through that. Definitely recommend that if if anyone is kind of on the on the on like both sides, like not sure what to do, definitely reach out to, you know, there's people on LinkedIn, any of us, um, because it is definitely it's a difficult conversation to have. Um, and yeah, so I definitely think that if you do need to have that kind of help. Um, definitely reach out to anyone from USDS or any or uh, CDF or anyone that you see, may come across LinkedIn because, um, yeah, career stuff is very difficult. But I'm really happy that I, I was in CDF and be able to be part of that network. Um, really quickly before we go to our last question, um, could you possibly just clarify what uh, the USDS is for people of our audience who may not be aware? Yeah, for sure. So USDS is the U.S. Digital Service. They're um, a part of the federal government. They actually sit under the um executive office of the president and work with different federal agencies to um, build out tech teams and different technical products and services. So they actually started as a result of the healthcare.gov crash that some of you might be familiar with when um, under the Obama administration, President Obama passed the Affordable Care Act and um, ultimately needed to launch an online um, portal for folks to sign up for insurance. But unfortunately, on the first day that it launched, uh, the program completely crashed uh, and only one person was able to successfully sign up uh, for insurance, which is obviously a massive technical failure. Um, and so as a result of that, not only was there this kind of ragtag team of Silicon Valley engineers brought in to essentially gut and revamp the entire program, but also 
this reckoning in government that we needed a long-term solution that wasn't just um, bringing in expensive and fancy consulting firms to, to do the job, but instead to bring in folks who were committed to um, doing it correctly the first time and, and making sure that tax dollars were wisely used. So um, that is kind of some of the origin story of USDS. There's definitely a lot more on their website. And if in various articles, if you Google them, there's tons of awesome stories of the work they've done. But um, definitely recommend checking them out. They're kind of a mid-career opportunity for, for folks um, interested in making that transition, as Regine mentioned. Amazing. Okay. So uh, as we're running a little bit out of time, uh, we're just going to transition over to our audience questions from our YouTube uh, live chat. So for our first question, how are the pairings for the one-on-one -on -one mentorships made? And what does a typical fellow slash mentor relationship look like? Yeah, I can tackle maybe the first half of this question, and then I'll hand it over to Tiffany and Regine to talk about their relationships. But um, once you're accepted into the fellowship, you get some fun forms to fill out, I promise. They're nothing too crazy, but um, we do ask all of the fellows for their preferences in terms of what they're hoping to learn about, whether that's something like Regine mentioned in terms of like, how do I make the transition from software development into product management, or how do I kind of uh, way options in the private sector versus the public sector, or how do I have work-life balance, or what does it mean to be a minority in tech? Um, so we kind of ask all those questions of you in terms of your interests. Likewise, uh, we're very fortunate to have an amazing community of mentors who are interested in paying it forward to folks such as yourself. Um, so we take a look at our database and our volunteers and see who might be a good fit in terms of what you're looking for and vice versa, what kind of advice they're able to provide. And then we go ahead and make that match. Um, there's no kind of hard and fast requirements in terms of how often you have to meet with them or anything like that. But it's really just to make sure that you have someone you can consult, whether you come across technical challenges at work or want to talk about kind of your professional journey. Um, we also have more than just the one-on-one -on -one mentor available to you. We have an entire mentor database. So, um, I mean, almost all of our fellows, I would say, like 99.9% .9 of them have really successful relationships with their mentors. But if you're ever looking for additional advice, we also have um, additional mentors available. But I'll let uh, Tiffany and Regine talk to the, more of the kind of relationship they had with their mentors. Yeah, so I have a pretty good relationship with my mentor, Peggy. She is a UX researcher who's working at a government <clears throat> consulting agency, and she's been able to help me go through a lot of different career decisions or moves because she's had a variety of different placements within startups or large companies and now within the civic tech space. And being able to hear from her as well as to ask questions and get guidance on even just my civic digital fellowship projects. A lot of times I would meet with her and ask her what I should do next because there wasn't someone quite with her same background of UX research or within product management on my team that I could solely rely on. So having someone within that space to work with me was really helpful there. And I've been able to talk to her about every two weeks or so during the or throughout the fellowship. And I still plan on talking to her regularly now just to bounce off ideas or catch up. And it's definitely great to have that support system there, as well as to have access to the alumni database that Rachel brought up a little bit there, where there are so many different successful alumni in a variety of different spaces. And having the opportunity or connection to them through the Civic Digital Fellowship is really incredible. Um, my relationship with my mentor, he was actually in USDS. So I think he was, he really influenced me in wanting to join. So that was a really positive um, impact on me. Um, but, you know, um, it, I, with the people I lived with um, in Washington DC during the CDF fellowship, which were all also fellows, um, I've definitely seen like, you know, some mentors will, um, you know, uh, usually meet twice twice during the fellowship or every weekend it really depends so it really is different um by the way but with me and my mentor we um 
we preferred um, email communication. So that was something that we usually had done. Usually by every two weeks, we did catch up. Um, we did meet, I think, three times during the fellowship, but um, he made it really special and invited me to the USDS headquarters um, right by the White House. So that was very impactful for me, um, getting to see, you know, like their workspace and everyone else in USDS. That was really awesome. Um, I definitely think that my relationship with him, like I feel comfortable with talking to him about anything, um, especially since he's helped me so much with my career development. Um, you know, I was really lost and like, I didn't know what to do with my life and I, uh, well, with my career life. Um, but he definitely gave me some really important, um, you know, like really like honest and important information because um, he's been everywhere. and. I felt like, you know, I didn't want to settle into something I didn't like. Um, and we had those all conversations that I remember all the time. And I'm really happy because now I'm in a position where I actually do enjoy my work. I don't feel so bored every day. Um, you know, I actually feel like I'm making an impact on my job as a product manager. Um, so I definitely feel like um, that relationship that I had is very sentimental to me and something that I really enjoyed during the fellowship. Amazing. So our next um, YouTube comment here, um, how was it determined which branch slash sector of government you'll be partnered with if you're offered an internship? Um, and this is sort of also related to another YouTube comment um, of do applicants get to rank agencies by preference? So maybe a combined answer here. Yeah, for sure. So mm -hmm. In terms of how our agency matching process works, we do not let applicants have a preference, um, just given the fact that we do work with so many different agency partners and there's sometimes upwards of 50 or 60 projects circulating around, it does make it really challenging um, to make sure that not only are applicants uh, interested in the projects they're working on, but vice versa, that they're qualified um, for the work that the agency is looking for. So. What we do in the background is we actually facilitate what I like to call a matchmaking process. So um, all the agencies submit their kind of project requirements to us, skill sets that they're looking for, um, et cetera, et cetera. We also look, of course, at your resume, your application, and your interests um, and make sure that they align with the project that we refer you to. Um, in the case that we are able to find a good match, what will happen is you'll actually have an opportunity to interview with the agency team. Um, those interviews kind of vary in terms of what they look like, but they might be more behavioral or they might be asking you about some of the technical experiences that you've had or your thoughts on the project and how you could contribute. Um, if that is a good conversation and the agency wants to move forward with your candidacy, then they, um, will extend an offer uh, and you will let us know whether or not you choose to accept the fellowship. In the case that the project is not a match for you, either on the agency side or you decide you are not um, interested in that project for whatever reason, that's usually a pretty rare case, but um, you will come back to us as a candidate. We actually put you back into our applicant pool and we try and find a different project to refer you to. Um, that happens a, a decent amount in terms of, um, you know, candidates not being selected. We do try our best uh, to find you a different project, but in the case that that's not successful, then that ultimately does lead to a rejection from our program. So I hope that helps clarify our, our matching process. Um, you can read a little bit more on our website as well about the overall timeline in terms of kind of how that works. And again, in the slides that I'll have uh, the Hack for Impact team send out, you can refer to kind of our um, dates as well there. All right, thank you. So um, we have another question. You're gonna wrap up with this one, but um, is there an opportunity for fellows to transition to full-time roles with their agency after the fellowship? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So um, it doesn't work like you might 
think of in like a traditional tech internship where, you know, you intern one summer and then they offer you a, a return offer for the next year to become a full-time employee. Um, instead, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on a multitude of factors, including things like government funding uh, and whether or not the government has the opportunity to bring you back. Um, we do really try and help any fellows that are interested in continuing on in their work to do so. Um, what that looks like varies from agency to agency. That might mean that you join a private sector company as a contractor and then work for your agency through a different company. Um, that might mean that you are brought on by your agency as a full-time hire. Um, we have had a full uh, or a number of candidates uh, come on into their agency in a full-time capacity. Uh, just the pathway for getting there might look a little bit different than kind of what you're used to in the, the tech industry. So um, it is a, a bit of a more complicated process, but we definitely work with candidates who are, are interested in doing so. Great, amazing. Um, I think at this point we are a little bit out of time. So uh, I'm just going to wrap up here. So um, thank you so much to our panelists for speaking with us today. This has been really amazing. Um, and thank you everyone who is um, attending the event and watching from home. Um, if you're interested in applying for the fellowship or just want to learn some more about it, we're going to um, provide some information from the slides, but you can also visit uh, codingitforward.com for more information there. Uh, we'll also be hosting speakers monthly, and um, if you can't wait until uh, the next month's speakers, uh, we also have a Bites of Good podcast that you can check out. Um, and if you want to learn some more about that, you can visit bitesofgood.org. Thank you again to all of our panelists, and thank you again to everyone who's in our audience. Um, and we can't wait to have you back again next month. Thanks for having us. <laughs>